Hello and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport who are literally knocking down barriers and challenging the status quo for women and girls everywhere. A massive thank you to Barclays for once again sponsoring this series of The Game Changers. Few brands have done more for women's sport. Barclays are a title sponsor of the Women's Super League and they're also backing the FA in the fantastic work it does to ensure that every schoolgirl across the country will have the chance to play football by 2024. My guest today is Laura Woods. Recently voted the SJA Sports Presenter of the Year, Laura's a regular on Sky Sports and is also host of Talk Sports flagship Sports Breakfast, one of the most listened to shows in the UK. Laura talks very openly about her journey from joining Sky Sports in 2009 and working as a runner, working her way up the broadcasting ladder in production before moving in front of the camera at Sky. She's gone on to have an extraordinary career working on some of the country's biggest sports shows. She's much admired for her relaxed, outgoing nature and her unflappable personality, making her one of the most in-demand sports presenters right now. I began by asking Laura about her recent award as Sports Presenter of the Year. Was it a shock to win? It was a shock, yeah, because I think everyone wants to think that they're in there for, you know, there's a potential to win it. And um, and I did think, I thought, well, I'm in there, so I've got a shot sort of thing. But I did look at the other people in the category and I thought, oh my goodness, they've, you know, they are really big presenters and really established presenters. So I kind of... I thought it'd be nice, but don't get overexcited. And then when the ceremony actually started, we were all on Zoom. So me and everyone from um, TalkSport all had a little Zoom set up in one window. And then in the other window was the link to watch the awards live. And the first award that they gave, they did a pre-recorded interview for. So me and Sam Matavos were texting each other. And we were like, oh, they've already interviewed the winners. So we, <laughs> like, oh, we definitely have a one thing because he was in category for commentator too. Um, and then as it went on, there was one that wasn't interviewed and I was like oh hang on a minute because my family were texting me going we're watching as well and and I said don't bother they've already interviewed the winners and then I think when it happened I was really shocked and and everyone else was because I'd sort of said no I won't win because they've already done it. It was a massive outpouring of of love especially on social media in terms of messages and tweets and so on too and previous women that have won that award include the likes of Alison Mitchell and Ellie Oldroyd and Claire Balding so how did it feel to hear your name in, a, in a, a sentence with those real trailblazers. It doesn't feel right. Honestly, it doesn't feel right because I because I feel like what I'm doing feels very separate to what they've done, to what they've achieved. Because we talk a lot about paving the way for female journalists, especially in sport. And um, I feel like I'm just following on. I've always felt like that. I've, I felt like it was harder for, for the likes of those women to actually pave the way because the world was so much more unaccepting to females than it is now so I feel like it's actually them that have done a lot of the hard work and I'm just sort of um I'm benefiting because I feel like they've massively opened the door for us it's still difficult you know it is still different but yeah to be named alongside them is very strange for me it it feels like they're giants and then and then it's like (laughs) (laughs) Were there women that you saw doing your job on on TV and radio as you were growing up as a girl? Yeah, Claire was actually one of them. And so was Gabby. I've I've talked about Gabby before because I remember seeing Gabby and for me, it was never that she was a woman. I just didn't, I don't think when you're younger, you have that kind of perception of a man being able to do something and a woman not because you've just seen them do it. So it doesn't, it doesn't stick in your brain that it's more difficult for them or they've had to overcome certain things to get there. Um, So I never really saw it like that. And I used to watch Question of Sport all the time, which is why it's funny now that I work with Ali, because, you know, there's a, a great mix of men and women on that program. So it's weird. I think it's when you are old enough to old enough to really understand what sexism is, that's when you start noticing it. Yeah. So, so for me, when I was younger, it was it was those women. They were the women that were there. And I liked them just because they were brilliant presenters, not necessarily because they were women. And who were your other role models growing up? Who inspired you? I think for me, it's much more closer to home. So you can have those people that are on screen that you look at and think, wow, they're amazing. But my mum was always 
now I look back at it, I can really, I can see it much more clearly, but she was like my hero when I was younger. We, we, my parents separated when I was about three and she had three babies. So we, we are, there's three of us, me and my two older brothers that are all within four years of each other. And, and my mom was young. She was really young when she had us all. So she had my big brother, Paul, when she was 20. So when, and so when they broke up, she had this job to bring up these three little kids that were all the same age. And, and it was really hard for her really. Um, and then the, her way of integrating us and keeping us all together and keeping us happy and safe was taking us to the rugby club and taking us to after school sports clubs and things like that. And the rugby club for us became this massive community and it was where all of our friends were and she became a coach. So she was a coach of a rugby team as well. So my brothers were each playing in different age groups and I was playing in my one and I was the only girl and I, I could recognize that. I knew that and, and I knew it was like a, a thing for other people, but it wasn't a thing for me. Um, and it especially wasn't a thing for me because my mom was one of the coaches. So you could, you, you know, the noise is there, but it was never negative really. It was, it was really positive. It was like, wow, there's a girl on the team and wow, there's a, there's a woman coaching that team. And my mom's team was the best one as well. By far. <laughs> they won everything. They were in the age group below me. And I was like, mom, like, why aren't you, can't you come and do my age group? But she was like, no, no, no. She liked to keep everything separate, I think. So yeah, she was, um, she was amazing. Excellent. I think, do you think seeing her so comfortable in that man's world had that impact on you then in terms of making it, normalizing it really? Yeah, a hundred percent. She was so comfortable. And um, when I ask her now, what's funny is when she talks about when she was younger, being really shy, like painfully shy. And then I think she kind of went through a lot of trauma in her life. And then her release was probably that rugby club as well. And, and it just gave her all this amazing confidence because we talk about now, we, we say how men can strip away confidence, but they can also give it to you and, and really build you up. And I think because she was so good at this job and, and she's so, char- she, her character is huge. You know, she's very charismatic. She's she's full of personality. And, um, and I think that really made her come into her own and she found a community that was hers, nobody else's. It wasn't her parents, it wasn't her husband husbands it was it was a a community that she had forged her way into and and was accepted in I think that just gave her this lease of life where she was just so comfortable so I saw her around men and and I saw her around women and she was comfortable in everybody's company so I think that's where I've learned that from and and I've obviously I have big brothers so for me that sort of environment isn't isn't very alien yeah, and no, I've got three older brothers, and I certainly think you just grow, grow up with it, don't you? Really, in yeah, terms of yeah. And um, I, I joke with I said to Kelly Cates for this podcast, too, and, and she we joke that she could have been a, a mathematician if you follow her kind of history because she studied that at, at university. But was it always sport for you? Was sport always the kind of target? Yeah, so for a while, when I was younger, I suppose you're put into brackets at school, aren't you? So you're either you're either a boffin, you're either sporty, you're either this, you're either that, you're girly, that sort of thing. And I was always put into that bracket of being sporty, and um, I didn't mind that. I enjoyed it because that was that was what I knew, and that's what I enjoyed. And then as I grew older, I I really wanted to be a vet when I was little. So because you, I think you don't really know, do you? You've got no idea. People say to you when you're younger, "What do you want to be?" And I'm like, "Well, I like animals, so I'll be a vet." And then when I started doing science at secondary school, I realized I wasn't top of the class at science. I was top of the class at English, but I wasn't at science. And I sort of sat there thinking, right. And then a teacher had a really harsh, harsh word with me. And she said, because I was so disruptive at school. And she said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a vet. And she went, well, you know that you need all your sciences. You need to be very good at them. Um, And you're not. And I was like, Okay, so instead of knuckling down in science, which is what she wanted me to do, I just decided to find something else that I was good at. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, that was my way of fixing things. And I loved English and I loved it for a really long time. And I remember watching, um, do you remember a press packer in Newsround? <laughs> So you had to be a press packer if you wanted to. So you'd send in a letter and explain why you wanted to be a press packer. And I remember sending one in and I never heard anything back. And um, when you're younger, you just assume, it's like when you enter a competition in Live and Kicking. So I used to watch Live and Kicking for however many hours it was on. And um, there was a competition. When my mum would go out the room, I'd call the number. And I think that just because I called that number, I'm definitely going to win. And I never won. I never won anything. And I was never invited back to be a press packer or anything like that. So, so those kind of little knocks were like really hard to take when you're little aren't they you're like well but I want to be a press packer so that was always in my mind but it took a long time to kind of connect the two together and I think I was doing um 
college well it was sixth form really and I was doing English there and again it was always my English teacher was probably she was probably another one of my um role models but it was a real love-hate relationship you know for, for a really long time she was my English teacher from way back when I think I was in year nine and I had a lot of issues when I was about that age and I just wasn't into school I didn't want to be there I felt really I just I just felt like I dreaded it I dreaded going in I I, I refused to do the homework I used to be able to hide things really well from my family. And I think when there's three kids to worry about, it's quite difficult for your mum to kind of hone in on you specifically. And um, one of my brothers, my middle brother, Lukey, he had quite a, um, a really strange illness, but it took a lot of my mum's attention. So I just kind of rebelled and I just went one way completely. And my English teacher, Mrs. Burrell, was so hard on me, you know, for, for good reason. I'd walk in with earrings in and she'd say, why are you wearing hoop earrings? And I'd say, well, I, I like them. And she'd give them here and you can have them back next week and roll your skirt down and you haven't done your homework, you're late. And I just felt like she was always on my back. And obviously, because I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing, it makes loads of sense now. So she was the one really that um, she kept a lot of enthusiasm in me for school. Um, and she really hammered that home. And I loved the English classes. And um, I realized that if I sat down and actually did it, I, I really enjoyed it. So that was what got me engaged. And then I suppose it wasn't really until I was at university. I studied print journalism at Kingston University and they didn't have an option for sports journalism. So there was everything else you could think of. There was <laughs> politics, you know, there was there was all um, creating web pages, um, writing for newspapers, um, creative writing, all these different things. And I was like, yeah, but what if I want sports journalism? And they said, oh, we don't do that. So the only thing that they did do, which really bugged me, actually, the only thing they did do is they had a, well, a newspaper that was run by the, what do you call it? By the journalists that were in their actual third year of, of school. So it's part of the curriculum as you run that newspaper. And, um, and you have to cover everything from finding sponsorship, finding the actual news stories, getting it printed, all that sort of stuff. And then there was a student union newspaper as well, which anybody could contribute to. So I went to see them and I said, can I just do some sports stuff for you? And they said, yeah, of course, because they want the content. So I went off and did football reports and rugby reports of the teams and and they were all our friends. So it was easy. And and I've still got the cuttings and they are dreadful. They're so funny. <laughs> it, was, it was once every two weeks that it was published. But on the second week, it, the deadline was right after the game. So one of the reports would be brilliant and really well thought out. And the other one would be dreadful, littered with spelling mistakes, people's names wrong, you know, just it, scores were wrong. And the boys would go, this is great, but what are you like? What were you watching? It's just funny. And then you, <laughs> your whole idea would be get it, get it to print and then go out and get drunk. And that was kind of the way it worked at uni, wasn't it? So a Wednesday night or Wednesday coverage Wednesday. Wednesday. Exactly. So the boys would play on Wednesday. I'd do the match report and then I'd go out that was my job and then <laughs> following Wednesday was easy because I had loads of time to do it but I loved it and I loved the experience of, of standing there and I can see myself doing it I had this pad of paper <laughs> and a pen and I'd watch the reports and I'd know exactly what was going on write everything down and I felt like a journalist I was like this is great and it was so exciting and and the boys really loved reading it even though it was crap like they loved reading it because they were like wow this is actually it's our game at uni and they'd have a photo of the minute as well. So they felt like, well, not like superstars, obviously, but felt like they'd actually done something cool. So that was, I just got this buzz from it. I was like, this is wicked. Like, I love it. And I, I it, and it wasn't really until after I left university that I thought I could do it professionally. You know, I, you still, you still don't really think you can kind of do that sort of thing professionally. Yeah. So you, you kind of love that whole being on the side with your notepad and, and reporting in terms of the written word. So what was it, do you think that made the TV presenting so much more attractive to you? I think from watching when I was younger from watching people in front of the screen I remember watching Fern Cotton she was on this show called Fingertips and I and I remember watching it thinking well what makes Fern so good and um, I know now it's just this natural warmth that, that Fern has but also just being completely yourself and comfortable in your own skin I remember thinking that's great and I didn't know why I liked it but I really liked it and I think if I really delve into the sort of psychology of it I think that for me, being comfortable in my own skin is something that I've never really managed to achieve, especially when I was younger. I was so painfully awkward in certain situations, but then really confident in others. Like when I was playing sport, I knew I was good at it and I felt really strong and really no one can judge you in that 
sense about the way that you look or what you sound like they're only judging you and your ability on the pitch and and I felt really comfortable and and I knew I was better than all the boys and I knew I could run faster so I loved that environment it gave me so much strength and acceptance so then when you kind of think about being becoming a presenter I suppose really you're, you're for me you're clutching at something you're really you're really clutching to be good and to be accepted and to be as much of you as you can physically be. And then um, trying to click that and trying to make that happen is something that you just can't make happen overnight. And I went traveling and while I was traveling, I, I'd already done a piece of work experience at Sky Sports. And um, because I'd met someone, this is a bit of a long winded story, but I'd met someone when I went to Australia before he was working at Sky as a runner and he actually gave me the email address and I just hammered this, this poor girl with emails, please let me come and do some work experience and eventually got it. And then it took a really long time of, of understanding what I wanted to be and thinking maybe I should just be a, a producer because my producer has told me I'm good at that. And he's told me that I shouldn't be a presenter. So you, you do get a lot of that as well. You get a lot of people telling you what they think you should be. Um, and why did he, why would he have said that? I mean, you obviously were a great producer in, on that pathway, but why would he have said you, he didn't think you could do it? Because his perception of presenters was it's a, an ego driven job. So it's ultimately you are feeding your own ego by being a presenter, but he get he's got it so wrong because it's almost, it's almost the opposite. It's, it's almost that you don't have an ego. You're very insecure. And, and actually what you're doing is trying to feel secure. It's kind of, it's really hard to explain that, but he, he just believed that. And he believed that I was more than a presenter because he's never been one. He's a producer. So, so his idea of what success is, was to be a producer. And, and that person in front of the camera is just a, a dolly or this and that, but, but it's so much harder. Yeah. It's not that at all. And, when you walk into someone like Sky Sports, I remember the first piece of advice I was given was don't tell anyone you want to be a presenter. And I said, why? Because everyone wants to be a presenter. All the girls that walk through the door want to be a presenter. But I said, but what if I do? What if I genuinely do want to be a presenter and I think I could be good at it? Oh, but your job is to be a runner at the time and you're essentially telling that person you don't want to do your job. So I found it really confusing and it takes a lot inside you to say to that person, no, no, no. I, I can do it though. Because then when they give you the chance and you're, you're crap, which you never <laughs> they go, what, what was that? And you're like, shit. <laughs> you're like, just let, give me another chance. Cause you're never good at it. And you're not good at it for such a long time. And it's really, really hard. <laughs> How tough was it at that? I guess that point, you remember that point of the first time you're in front of the camera or, you know, the microphone. Mm, really hard because the voice that comes out of you is not your voice. So we sit here and say the best presenters are the most authentic, but trying to become authentic is really hard because you've got this microphone and this camera lens and you know people are watching. And I remember trying to do a show reel. So someone said to me, right, you know what? A friend of mine, a cameraman, I said, I don't know how to do this. And he said, let's make a show reel together. And then he said, right, we're going to go, look, we're going to go to loads of different places and we're going to film in, in fields and we're going to go to, well, I was working on Speedway at the time, we're going to go to a Speedway track and do a link in front of a camera. And I was like, how long does the link have to be? And oh my God, the it, <laughs> it was painful. I could see it on his face. He was so energized and then he just lost it all. And by the 25th take, he was like, he went, should we just tinker with the words? And I went, yeah, okay. And then <laughs> should we put a cut in here and do it somewhere else? So it was kind of like three words here, five words there. And, and it was dreadful. And I remember driving home thinking this isn't for me. So those early days of trying to be a presenter were just the most painful of my life. And I don't know why I kept doing it. I, I think I think what it was is mm -hmm. I, I get a real buzz from um, from other people. So I really like talking to people and finding out who they are. And I just find humans interesting. And I find the psychology of humans really interesting. So if you look at it like that, or as a human being is a bit like a Rubik's Cube and you're trying to figure out how to open them up and how to get the best out of them. It's really fun when you do. And it's, and it's really fulfilling when, when you, when you get that and you go, ah, oh, I've asked the right thing or they trust me enough. And I've obviously mastered something in the way that I'm talking to them. That means that they trust me. And I really loved that. And I used to do these um, interviews with darts players behind the scenes. So only their answers would be, would go to air, but it was my job to get those answers. And 
And I used to go back to the truck and cut it together myself. And then that would go out. And it was honestly, they used to call them shit quotes. So <laughs> but it was like, oh, who's going to do the shit quotes today? And the, quotes, the quotes were obviously the quotes from the players. And, and I was like, always like me. And, and they were like, yeah, let her do it. Cause no one else wants to bloody do it. No one wants to talk to these darts players and ask the same questions. But I took, I took great pride in it. And I always did. And that was when I was a runner. So I always had that part of my job wherever I went, I felt was work experience for me. That's probably where I, I think I kept that drive because I thought I want, I want, I love that relationship with, with someone and that's where I am good. So if I can try and get better at the pieces to camera on my own, then I can link the two together. But I avoided it for as, as long as I could actually. And where was that step away from the... Um shit quotes onto I guess more where you're in front of the camera and doing that how did you make that transition from executive producer there was there was so much I did a couple of screen tests for Sky Sports News and it was awful oh god it was awful <laughs> I realized and I don't know why I I was so young at the time so I don't know why I didn't think this through but I am not or I wasn't at the time a very fluid reader and um, I actually thought for a really long time I might be dyslexic. That's yeah. that's how bad I thought. Shit, why why am I not? Why can't I do this? It's just reading. And I'd, I'd watch the other girls practice, and they'd be so fluid with it. And I, and I was like, why am I tripping over everything? That's obviously a big thing if you want to be a presenter, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the auto cue, bring a sentence together, and yeah, <laughs> read the auto cue. Anyway, I couldn't do it, and I, I did. I did this one screen test, and it was dreadful, and it really knocked the stuffing out of me for probably about two years. I'd say it was it was horrible. I didn't get any feedback, so I decided to go and ask. Knocked on the boss's door, and he said to me, "Go and look at other presenters on Sky Sports News. See what they do, and do that." I was like, what? No, like, why? Stop it. Like, why is everyone saying these things? And it really frustrated me. And yeah, the whole reading thing, I just kind of thought, well, I'm, you know what, I'm going to avoid it altogether then. I'm I'm going to find a way around this. So I'm a presenter that doesn't use auto cue because I, I spoke to a few people and they said, not everyone does it. Like some people don't, they feel comfortable without it. So I was like, right, I'll be that presenter then. So um, I just kept cracking. I kept trying to get bits and scraps from different places. I did a little bit of NFL. I emailed everyone at Sky really. I mean, I emailed all of the producers that I knew from, from running and working on different shows and just said, do you have any opportunities? Is there anything small I can do? Pre-recorded things if you don't trust me to do it live. And I ended up getting a pitch side gig at the NFL two or three times a year, but it was amazing. And then I started doing bits outside of Sky with um, Matchroom Sport. They just gave me a few golf things and that was memorizing lines and delivering them. And I was dread, I don't know. I think it helped a lot that, that we all were, all were friends because if we weren't, they would have sacked me <laughs> much, much sooner. And then really what it was with my boss is I said to him, look, can I use one of the spare cameras? I'm just going to go and interview the players because they have much bigger personalities than we ever give them credit for because the post-match interviews are just in and out. How do you feel? Blah, 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 I've done. But they're so funny and they've got real quirky personalities. So he was like, fine, you know, go and <laughs> And I just used to interview them, do silly questions. I'd ask them some serious ones. It was about the Premier League at the time, Premier League darts. I'd ask them some serious ones. And then I'd follow them up with, with silly quizzes that related to their nicknames. So that, there was one called Andy Hamilton and his nickname was The Hammer. So I always remember I gave him a quiz on hammers. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, and he knew them all because he was like, yeah, that's great. And one of the answers was Tony Mallet. And, it, you know, there were just some really silly things in there. And I cut it all together. I'd script it and I'd do a voiceover for it, put some music on and then stick it out on YouTube. And um, I didn't have the confidence to do pieces to camera yet. I still tried to avoid those. So stuck them out on YouTube. And um, then that led to other things basically. And that just rolled on. And there were a million other little side bits and jobs and stuff that, that eventually led to kind of a proper job as a presenter. And that was on Soccer AM Online. And have things ever not gone to plan in terms of your career path? You're going to look at that trajectory, but are there things where you, you've lost out on things? Or Yeah, yeah. I, I, I lost that, that job, the, um, dark, the, sorry, the um, uh, golf one I was telling you about. I actually lost out on that to another girl, and um, they said that she was cheaper <laughs> because what they did halfway through – was they said, we're going to drop your rate. And I said, you can't drop my rate. I, you've agreed to these amount of dates. I said, that's really unfair. And there was a lot there was a lot of pride in me that just thought I can't allow this to happen. Yeah. So then for the next season, they said they'd found someone else who was cheaper, but I think she was just better. 
And I watched her and she was miles better than me. And I, and I understood why. And I thought, oh God, like how, how do I process that feeling of like rejection and then knowing that it's because you're not good enough. And I did struggle with it actually. I struggled with it for a long time. And um, I went to see this woman who was really, she is a classically trained musician. So she's a harpist and her ideas in training herself classically and being the best of the best translate to other performance-based um, jobs. So she essentially is a performance coach. And um, I met her because I knew someone in the world of sport that used her for sport, but, but she was so unlikely. She was tiny, her name's Fiona, really posh. And I walked through the door and she <laughs> looked me up and down. And, and I, I remember thinking she's shaking her head at me. Like, well, she doesn't like what I'm wearing. She doesn't like the way I'm speaking. And, and she didn't like the way I was speaking. And she said, why do you, you're, you're coming off on the end of your sentences and you're not, you're not being, you're not saying the words properly. You're not pronunciating your, your, your vowels and your whatevers and all these different things. And anyway, I worked with her for a little while. And um, she said, why? So what's the struggle at the moment? And I said, I can't remember my lines. I'm really struggling to remember my lines. And she went, right. Okay. So your eyes aren't turned on, your ears aren't turned on, the two sides of your brain aren't connected. And she taught me to do this thing called cross crawl, where your right hand goes to your left knee and then your left hand goes to your right knee. She said, do it for me. And my right hand went to my right knee immediately. She went, see, that's because you're one-sided. You need to cross over. Even your brain isn't doing what you tell it to. So we used to do all these really weird exercises. So before a show, I would practice those exercises that she taught me cross crawl like this, doing this sort of stuff, holding a pen in my hand and then doing a figure of eight. So that would open my eyes up and make my eyes connected with my brain. Oh. Rolling the outside of my ears like this, pulling the bottoms down. There was a big process, a big sort of thing and had it all written down and then I learned it off by heart and it worked. And I have no idea why it worked, but it did. And um, I actually went to her and I said, I've lost that job and someone else has got it. And she went, right, find me her. So I Googled her on the internet <laughs> and I found her um, showreel. And she said, right. And she said, um, that girl does her very well, but she can't do you and you can't do her. I thought, right, okay. And she said, so all you can do is be the best you. So let's make the best you. And it stuck with me. And I thought, God, she's so right. And um, and that's every time I think about comparing myself, I think about that because there's just no point. There's no point looking at someone else and going, God, they do that really well. Yeah. Because yeah, they do, but they won't do what you do really well. So so that, that was um, a big kind of step forward in accepting rejection, which I think is comes with being a yeah. a lot. Huge. I want Fiona's details. She sounds absolutely well, fascinating. I would send her, honestly, she would, oh, she would be great to speak to. She is <laughs> just amazing. She's really, really amazing. You, you mentioned you covered a lot of sport in those early years. There's some of the less mainstream sports, I think like 10th and bowling and table yeah. tennis. One. So how do you learn to present sports well that you don't know or that other people don't know well? It's really hard that actually, because when you're trying to get opportunities, the easiest thing for someone to do would be to give you an opportunity in something that you know. So that would be great. But when you're trying to get those opportunities, they're inevitably only in things that somebody else probably doesn't want to do or um, that is quite niche, which makes the job 10 times harder. It, it would be now, you know, now that I'm an experienced presenter, if they said to me, go and do ping pong. I go, oh God, like, because I know how much work it is and I wouldn't be the best presenter at it. So all of these things, when, when you're thrown any kind of scraps, you know, when you're given any kind of opportunities and that's how it felt. But at the time I was like, yes, like I love scraps. Give me anything I can get. All you have to really do is just go and absorb yourself in it completely. So I would sit at my desk and I would watch programs in the last three years I'd fast forward the actual sport because that's fine. Like those are the bits that you know, but it was all the bits in between the presentation parts and the interviews and the, the way that you're being questioned and, and personalities that you're getting back because they're usually the same players anyway. So I'd really go and do that. And then I would research and it was a lot, you know, it's, it's a lot to do, but you're trying to be confident and you're trying to, be comfortable and make the viewer feel that you you have control of this whole thing and you only have that with knowledge. Yeah. If I've gone into something and I've not been fully prepped, I will slip up and I will be found out immediately. 
And those are the kind of things, you know, I, I experienced that actually when I was interviewing darts players. So sometimes there were so many games in those early rounds of darts. You might have been working on something else that day. So you missed a game. So you'd interview this guy and you go, oh, wow, what about that 170 checkout? And he's like, yeah, but I lost a leg after. And I was like, shit. And, you know, little things like that, you think, oh, God, you can't miss it. You can't miss a trick because you are interviewing the person that experienced all of it. So it's up to you to absorb all of that information, regurgitate it. I'd, I'd tell people around me. I'd, I'd tell my boyfriend at the time. I'd tell my mum. I'd be like, ask me about what happened in this. <laughs> She'd go, OK, what happened? And I'd say, well. And then I'd just like reel off all this useless information. But it helped me. So that's the only way you can do it is, is just arming yourself with as much information as possible and, and then managing to, to get comfort in that zone. But yeah, those that I loved all of those things. I, I loved those sports because it felt like a Champions League final for me. It was the biggest thing ever. I was I was live presenting and live reporting. And I got this unreal buzz that that's how I know I'm meant to do it because it's just this feeling of there's something about being live and doing live telly and, and working on sport that it's so unpredictable. I don't know where you can get that from anywhere else. That does. Um, I was going to ask you, I'm going to go on to talk about the breakfast show, but how do you then, I hear you kind of on a Monday morning, how can you absorb all the sport that's been on that weekend? I mean, that must be such pressure to have watched all the key. There's so much happening. You clearly yeah. can't physically watch it all. So how do you juggle that with having enough knowledge to be able to engage in conversation? What's hard about that job is the early morning because you absorb everything and then you have to get up early. So you can't stay up too late. So you can't yeah. you have watch the day like I can't because yeah. it's been too late. So what happens for me is the longer you're in that, that job, the more it, you, you, it's like in your pause, you know, you, you just, you don't realize you're absorbing information, but you are. And you're so comfortable with that topic that I, I go to a game at the weekend. So it means I can't watch the other games live because I'm watching that game live and then I'm driving home. So then I'm going back over and I'm watching the highlights and I'm saying, okay, fine. And, and it just becomes easier. The more you do it, it's kind of like you're, you're riding a bike. It just gets easier and easier. But also you kind of have to, sometimes your boss doesn't like you saying, well, I didn't watch that game because I was at this game, but he doesn't like you saying that because then you've got to really analyze it. So sometimes it's about trusting the, the person that you're with, the expert, trusting he's watched all the game and making sure you just know the right questions to ask and, yeah. and taking all the highlights in. And what else I find really great is I read a lot. So I'll read a lot of things like um, the newspapers, obviously we, we do them in, in the show anyway. So I'll read a lot of the opinion pieces and I'll go, oh, God, that's interesting. And then you always have to give credit to the person that's written it. I, I kind of believe quite strongly in that is not just to read an article and then pick up a piece of information. I always think, well, this is interesting to say that Henry Winter said this in the Times today in his piece or, or whatever, or other journalists are huge in that kind of thing. But Again, if, if I have had an early night and I go to where not having watched as much football as I feel like I need to, found out immediately and, and I end up just going, I actually didn't watch that game because I can't do it. I can't, I can't fake it. So yeah, yeah it's, um, it's a real, it's a juggle because the alarm goes off at four and you just think, oh, sometimes if you want to do all the work, you're up until 11. So it's, it's a real, it's a hard balance. Indeed, indeed. You once said women can be brain surgeons, but heaven forbid they dare talk about football. <laughs> but how do you deal with the criticism that, that comes your way simply for doing your job? Oh, I, it's really strange because sometimes I feel like I've mastered it and I'm like, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter this week. And then next week when I'm much more emotional, my hormones have changed. It really hurts me. So it's like walking down a, a road with a load of potholes and sometimes you can skip over them and sometimes they completely suck you up. I, I, I find the kind of get back in the kitchen comments. I, I find those they're in, they annoy me a little bit, but then sometimes I'm kind of like, well, that's such an old joke. And if you haven't come up with anything new for the last however many years, I feel sorry for you. If your opinion of a woman is genuinely that she needs to stay in the kitchen, you haven't evolved either. Like, what are you doing? You know, there was one the other day, it was a, um, and it genuinely made me laugh. He said, he said, talk sport is shite. You're a terrible presenter. You don't know anything about football. Go and work on something like netball. And then there was like a question mark. So it was like, netball? <laughs> And I read it and, it and it made me laugh and I genuinely laughed at him and I sent loads of laughy faces back. And then I looked at his page and I realized he'd sent almost that exact same, that exact same 
message to a load of different women. He sent one to Jules Breach as well, but he changed it to BT Sport. And then he sent something else to a load of um, journalists that were working, that were covering the um, horse racing, the exact same one. And I thought, is he a bot? What is he? And I realized that a lot of the time, these people, we, we give them so much credit where we shouldn't because these people are probably hurting in their own lives. And what makes them buzz is sending someone a nasty message and then you acknowledging it. So they know one of their arrows that they've fired at you has has landed and it's hurt you. So I've learned to ignore ignore a lot more than I ever used to because I used to be quite, I don't, I used to be quite sparky with them. You know, I I would, I would really react. So, so now I don't react as much, but it it hurts. And I suppose it hurts more when it potentially comes from somebody that, is in your industry or someone that you you respect. And that doesn't happen often, I have to be honest. But it's those people that I, I would rather take their opinion on. We've mentioned the breakfast show there. So how tough was it for you to take over that that flagship talk sports show, both the breakfast show and, you know, taking over from a legend like Alan Brazil, who'd been there for so many years? That was really hard. I think the hardest thing about that was that Alan is someone that I've listened to for years and years and he's one of my dad's heroes and my brother's heroes and we've all listened to him as a family you know my dad would come and pick us up from my mum's house and drive us back to his and talk what would be on whether we liked it or not yeah. when you're a little girl sometimes you want to just listen to Capital or Radio One and you want to hear some songs and it would always be talk sport and I learned to love it from a really young age and um, that's probably that's probably fed into why I want to do it so that voice Alan's voice was always a comfort to me so then having to replace him was was a struggle for me because I knew how the listeners felt if they were saying oh what like we want to hear Alan I there was part of me that sort of thought yeah me too the timing of it as well, just as you're going into COVID, just was really hard for me because I, I had no release. So I, I had no sport to talk about, no co-host. And that could be hard because it was there was always a delay in the early days. It was a delay. We didn't have each other on Zoom either. So oh, wow. when, we, when, we, when each other were talking and it was just so for four hours like that, your brain just fries. And, and then it, it's really hard as well to create a rapport with somebody. And our co-hosts were changing all the time. So even though Ali was consistent, we'd have another co-host. We'd have Freddie. Freddie joined after a while. And then it was about making Freddie feel comfortable. So, yeah, those early days were really hard. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that, that difficult. Um, And then you'd come home and and all you'd want to do really was go to the pub or see your mum or see your friends and stuff like that and take your mind off of it. But there was none of that because we were so we were isolated, essentially. So, yeah, I found it I found it really difficult. And I. I really wanted to say to people, please don't judge me on what you hear now because this isn't and will never be the breakfast show. This is this is all of us trying to survive in to a world get through, yeah. Before, and and know anything else. So yeah, it was they were hard days, those ones. And was there a moment when things turned a corner and you you felt more settled in, in that role? Yeah, I think as soon as sport came back, and genuinely it was overnight, as soon as it came back, I just went, Oh my God, and now I can talk to you like I would and I can show you how I feel about these games and show you my knowledge and um it was just like this this veil had been sort of lifted it was so different I've managed to find a better way of connecting with Ali so that we weren't talking on top of each other and you know you were kind of laughing for no reason in the early days to fill air where there was a delay you kind of (laughs) you had a few of these awkward laughs to sort of fill the time I remember getting a load of messages saying, stop giggling. You're such a giggly little girl. And it really affected me because I was like, am I not allowed to laugh at things? And I actually stopped laughing. It genuinely stopped me from laughing. And even now it it still affects the way I react to things because I lean back and I don't want to laugh on the microphone. And I, even though I want the guests to know that I find him funny, and that, sometimes that's what that's all about, isn't it? Acknowledging that you yeah. have a reaction to somebody. It, it has affected the way that I kind of react to things. Other than that, I've, I've now felt now I'm a year on. I've suddenly relaxed into it, and I've, I feel like I've, I feel like I've experienced almost everything that we could possibly have experienced in a year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, there were so many different issues that came into play. You know, when Black Lives Matter came about, we we covered LGBTQ issues, um, we covered domestic violence. We've really had a lot this year because with no sport the social issues became even louder yeah. and I'm glad they were to be honest I'm glad that we we had a platform to talk about them 
on air with and I know that it's it's been good for a lot of people so but you know reflecting on it if if someone had said to me this is what's going to happen in the first year I honestly don't know if I would have taken the job I I just don't think I would have and has that negativity reduced now? I mean, clearly you're winning amazing awards, must help. And, and the fact that you're a year in, but have you seen that that die away, those voices? Yeah, I have actually. It's, it's suddenly, I don't even know when it happened, but people like to get on the bandwagon. So when, when someone goes, this has changed, everyone goes, I don't, we don't like change. Yeah. yeah. Can you change it back? And, and then like, no, 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 it's not going to change back. And then for a while they hate you for it. And then eventually it dies down. And the best kind of feedback I get that I will take on board are the people that say, you know what, we weren't keen on this at the start, but but now I really like it and you've changed my mind. And my boss actually said to me when I when I was struggling, he said, look, do what you've always done and just win them over. And I, I do feel like it's been a kind of life of winning people over or trying to win people over. So yeah, there's a there's a big part of that in my in my mind that I just think, well, yeah, you know what, that's part of the job. You are a presenter, you've you've put yourself out there. So um yeah, it's your job to try and look after and entertain these people and and it did, yeah, it definitely did change. And I know you've supported other female broadcasters and journalists in the past as they've come under attack. So how important is it that we kind of hold each other up? And and how important do you think it is that male allies play their part? I know you've had great support there too. Massively, massively, because I I love the support that I have from that community, the, the female uh, community on Twitter who are also into their sport. And there's so many young girls that are, that are writing things. And I think, wow, like you're writing match reports and you're having the confidence to put them on Twitter. And then you're getting dogs abuse from men that are telling you to get back into the kitchen. You don't know what you're talking about. And, and, I, and I really like engaging with those kind of girls because I think I don't realise... I'm that person now. It's still it's still very strange to me because I'm still treading water in many aspects. So I'm sort of like, hang on a minute, you you want you're looking to me for inspiration, where I am I don't I don't know if I can give it to you. <laughs> so I I'm finding that that I find amazing. I'm 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 getting to grips with it. But also talking to those girls, I I love it because I'm like, wow, well, you know, what are you doing and what are you going through? And you know what, don't worry about it because like we I'm I'm experiencing that too and I'm going to be a weathered presenter now. So it is it's it's important. It's important that we all kind of have those experiences and talk about them and share them so that we can support each other because it it makes a big difference. It's it's strange, isn't it? There's a there's a a thing in the world I think where women are naturally pitted against each other and we can't all exist in in the world of broadcasting without one of them being the best or you two are good but you look better or or you you two are good but you sound better and actually your knowledge is better and it's it's like stop comparing it doesn't need to be like that there are enough jobs for all of us and everyone is brilliant at their own thing so that part of the world I think is is great in terms of women supporting each other but I do think that there is a, a huge place for male allies. Gary Neville, I find, is amazing. Just, just so brilliantly supportive. You might do something and he might retweet it. And that's all he needs to do to show his support. Yeah. He's not quite retweeting, going over the top and saying, oh, this is amazing. You all should support Laura. She's a woman, but it doesn't matter. You, should, you know, He does it and it's natural and seamless. And I genuinely don't think he does it because we're women. I think he does it because genuinely he believes in, in uplifting people that he thinks are good. I think those are the kind of levels of support from men that are crucial because they are norms. So it's just Gary going, that person there is a colleague of mine. It doesn't matter if she's a woman or a man. She's a colleague of mine and I think she's doing a good job and I'm showing my support for her because then people go, oh, if Gary thinks she's cool, then yeah, maybe we think she's cool as well. And it happens with all of the guys I work with on TalkSport. I really appreciate when they show me a level of respect because you can hear it. I said this when Karen kindly got all this abuse. I said, unfortunately, the playing field isn't level. The reaction isn't equal yet. For example, for Leeds to have put what they did on their social media about Karen. Oh, but we would have done it if there was a man and all this sort of stuff. But the the difference is the reaction to a man saying it wouldn't have been the same. And that's the kind of naivety that I think people need to accept is it's not a playing field yet. So you do have to help along the way because until we get to a level playing field Karen will always get more abuse I will always get more abuse for for any of my opinions than a man will get but also when a man gets abuse sometimes it doesn't affect them as much because they are generally they feel accepted in that world that's where the I suppose the goalposts are different and that's where I think male allies come into it and are so important because 
they can change perceptions. They, they can change perceptions of the general public just by accepting you and just by showing you that kind of subconscious support. It does impact people. I loved your point about the retweeting. I, I read a, something yesterday from Julie DeCaro, who's American, wrote the book Sidelined, an American sports presenter, female sports presenter. But she was encouraging men rather than just like, if you can like it, retweet it. That the power of a retweet from another male presenter of a female's content is massive. It really is. And it and it's I'm I'm I love that someone else is talking about that because it because it genuinely the first time Gary Neville ever did that to one of my tweets. I honestly, I went, oh my God. And I lifted up my phone and I went, Gary Neville's just, and I sent it to my mum. I said, Gary Neville's just retweeted my tweet. <laughs> and it was, I can't even remember what it was now, but it was, it was obviously something back in the day. So it was like maybe four years ago or something like that, three, four years ago. And it was so, it was such an impact on me, but I thought, well, that's going to have a massive impact on everyone that follows him as well, subconsciously. And then I'm going to go, oh, wow, he's, he's retweeted. But they'll go, cool, he has respect for that woman. So, yeah. so we should too. It's below the radar, isn't it? I like that. It's not. It's yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, with Alex Scott officially announced as a new presenter of BBC's Football Focus this week, do you feel that we're finally reaching a, a tipping point for women in, in sports broadcasting? I think so. I think I'm always careful with, with how I approach this because it's like I said earlier on, what I'm really aware of is you know, in, there's been interviews that I've done in the past where people have said that I'm blazing a trail and, and I might be in, in my own way, but I feel so strongly that there are so many people before me that have blazed an even harder trail. To be honest, Scotty, no one's been a female pundit before like that. And, and what she's doing is, I've watched her, you know, I used to do little bits of presenting. She she was one of the other presenters of Soccer AM online. So oh, in the last wow, yeah. like five or six years, it's been since Euro 2020, really. So we, we were both in France together. We were both doing these bits and bobs. And, and it was funny at the time and she was still playing as well. And we were just larking around and it was a great job. And then you fast forward and you think, wow, like, look what she's doing now. What really frustrates me is that when, you, when people criticise Scotty and say, well, you know, she's not got the level of experience as Roy Keane or Graham Sooner sitting next to her or, you know, Cara or Neville, Jamie Redknapp. But you know what she does have is huge balls to be able to sit next to those guys and have her own opinion, back it up and disagree with them. Would you? She's not just done all of her homework and she's not just eloquent enough to deliver it because that's a big part of broadcasting that gets overlooked is you could be a brilliant sports person, but if you can't deliver what you're trying to say, you can't communicate properly, none of your points are going to hit home. And she does, she does the two in sync and she does it with this unbelievable strength to be able to sit next to those boys in that, in that room. It's hard enough when you're a presenter and you're asking questions to those guys it's hard enough seeing the, the whites of their eyes, you know, but, but if you were sitting there saying, well, actually I think it's this, I mean, I would shit myself, <laughs> well, but I absolutely would. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't get enough credit for that for me. And we're saying people, you mentioned Alex, but also or Scotty, Claire Balding and Ellie Aldroyd who present much more than just sports programs. Is that something that you'd like to do in the future? I think for me, I love football but it's not, it's not been my only sport that I've been in love with throughout <clears> my life. So I feel really comfortable in football, but it's not necessarily somewhere that I, I want to stay forever. I just don't think I'd ever want to leave it, if that makes sense. But stuff happens, things change. You, I've learned that I could say one thing and then next week something else could happen. But I always, it's funny when you talk about Claire, I always remember watching the 2012 Olympics and I remember seeing her talk open-ended for maybe five or six minutes on the flowers that were outside the Olympic stadium. She just started talking about these flowers. And I was like, wow, I, what are these flowers? <laughs> I was like, what? I'm so interested in these flowers. <laughs> and it was because of her delivery and she was word perfect, not scripted, just came out of her mouth. She was just thinking on the spot. And her, her performance at the 2012 Olympics was, I think she won an award for it, actually. I was blown away. And, and one thing that that did do for me, actually, was um, I remember thinking, I can't deliver like that. I can't speak without going, um, uh, stopping what I'm saying, tripping over certain words. I need something in front of me that's scripted. I need, I need something to kind of, like, to tell me what I'm going to say. 
that's actually why I started working in radio because in radio you have to be more fluid I needed something I needed more experience and it and it was because of watching Claire do that piece about bloody flowers (laughs) (laughs) just these little things have an impact on you that can be so lasting um, and finally, two final questions. One is, how do your family react? How does your, we, we sort of start to talk about your mum, but how does your mum feel now in terms of the your career path and all that you're doing? I mean, she probably wants you to do more in rugby, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, she probably does, actually. She <laughs> She's so proud. And my mum gets up every morning at six and listens to my show. Oh, she, wow. She has done since I took that job. And she will always message me and she'll say morning beautiful or more she calls me Larry morning Larry and um it's just really funny and and it, it, what it is is it's almost like someone's just holding your hand because those early days were so hard <laughs> and like <laughs> she she was kind of the only one really that I wanted to to talk to but then you want to filter a little bit of that information because what you want to do for your parents as well is protect them a little bit so they don't see you hurting if that makes sense you want to say oh mom I'm really hurting but you don't want to put that pain on her so it was a bit of a tug of war when I was going through that early stuff. I didn't want to tell her everything. And then I, and then I did. And I just said, like, I'm, I'm really finding this hard and I don't think I, I don't think I'm good at it. And I don't think I can do it anymore. I've, I've just had a message and it says this. And, and I realized actually that all those things that hurt me hurt her as well. In, in any point of my life, she's been on that road with me. So I think, yeah, I think there's a big, there's a big connection between me and my mum. I love the fact that she's listening to you in the morning. That's beautiful. Um, and just finally, you obviously had such an incredible career so far, but if you had to share some advice, and I'm sure you're often asked, but with either you know your younger self or, or a, a woman coming into the sector now, what would, what would that be? I, I think about this a lot. And I, I think, A, give yourself a break because you're constantly trying to hit targets or hit get to somewhere by a certain time. And, and it takes longer than you think. I, I didn't start, I was working in TV for about six years, but I think five, six years before I even got an opportunity to do anything on camera. And somebody said to me, one a journalist I was working with the other day, said, you're a bit like a Jamie Vardy, aren't you? <laughs> so, you, know, you? You went through all the lower leagues and all the, all that sort of crap stuff. Well, and then, and then you've, you've hit the big time, but you're a bit older now. And I, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take that. I kind of get what he means. But yeah, I, I didn't... Um, I used to, I was really, really hard on myself. And I think for, for young girls that want to be a presenter, I think it's harder now because when I was a bit younger, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have Twitter. And I'm very cautious of the fact that um, it looks better than it is. You know, you can really make it look glamorous and it's not glamorous. It's, it's like, you know, you're sitting in a wet seat watching football if you're in a, a place that's not undercover and it's freezing cold and, You've, you've really got to do it because you've got this passion for it. And and then you've got to deal with people that don't think you've got enough passion for it or enough knowledge. So be kind to yourself as much as possible. I was listening to a podcast the other day and I, I loved it. Jake Humphreys was on with um, Fern Cotton. And he said to Fern, whose voice do you hear most in one day? And she went, my husband's. And he went, no, it's not. She went, my kids? And he was like, no, 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 it's not. It's yours. And he said, it's your voice in your own head. And when you wake up in the morning, if you're going to yourself, oh, you need to lose more weight or you're not good enough at your job. You've not got to somewhere fast enough. That starts to, to filter. That's, that's your voice. That's, that's like somebody saying to you, you're not good enough externally, constantly. And I realized that the other day when I woke up and I was walking to the bathroom and I thought, oh, I'm too heavy or I'm too this and too that. And I was like, stop saying that. So I think really you've, you've got to, there's a lot of self-care in this industry that you have to have. You know, I'm 34 in the summer and I'm only just discovering that now. So yeah, I think don't be too harsh on yourself because all the other lessons about read all the time, do all your homework, absorb everything. We know that, everyone knows that, you know, that's that's your own you've got to have that passion already to, to do the job and you do, otherwise you wouldn't be where you are. So yeah, I think go easy on yourself and don't be so negative because you have to be your own cheerleader, I think. I love talking to Laura. It's clear to see why she's had so much extraordinary success and I look forward to following her career progression in the future. If you'd like to hear more about the career paths of other trailblazing women in sports broadcasting, my previous guests on the podcast have included Gabby Logan, Claire Balding, Kelly Cates, Ellie Oldroyd, Ebony Rainford-Brent and Jess Crichton. You can find out more about these guests 
and all the others from previous series at fearlesswomen.co.uk. And that's also where you can see some of the other work I do, including the Women's Sport Collective, a network for any women working in sport. You can also sign up to Changing the Game, our free weekly newsletter that highlights the latest developments in women's sport. Thanks once again to Barclays for their very kind support of the Game Changers, to Sam Walker, our executive producer, Rory Ouskri on sound production, and to Kate Hannon, who's behind the scenes making sure everything runs smoothly. Do come and say hello on social media where you'll find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Game Changers or at Sue Anstis. That's it for this series of The Game Changers. We'll be back with more amazing trailblazing guests later in the year. But before I say goodbye, ahead of the Tokyo Olympics, we have a very special bonus episode coming up with one of Team GB's most extraordinary athletes. I got to sit down with world champion heptathlete Katerina Johnson-Thompson. I can't wait to share the episode with you. At 23, going into Rio Olympics, everything had changed. You know, I was very low on confidence. I'd been through a number of different serious injuries, um, a number of big defeats, and a number of times where I, you know, couldn't handle the pressure almost. So I think that in between those years, it was I did lose the love for the, the sport a little bit. That, that was a very tough time for me in order to, to break through that and come out the other side of it and compete just for the love of sport. Um, it was a very long, hard road. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport. <laughs> <laughs>